right before the prayer, as it was announced, let us pray, that we as usual looked both to Charlie and said, it's time to pray. And we did our hands, and he did his hands, and he smiled. What if when it comes to times in our lives in which we know what we need to do, we simply held our hands? There's nothing to do with your hands during prayer, is there? We're not teaching him that this is a ritual that you must do in prayer, but it's a reverent attitude. To, to pull all things that are going on and bring life to a pause and pray. But I know we know that life is just not that simple. There are a lot of things going on in life and we're here tonight to ask one question. Who controls your life? It was in the passage that was read for us just a moment ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that I want you to turn. Because before we get into the idea of the lesson tonight, I want us to look at a couple of verses to get us a little context of what's happening in this particular section so we can walk through verses 3 through 7. And in the midst of walking through that particular section, I want to ask a couple of questions. But I want you to see verse 1 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, specifically verse 1. He says, Therefore... Seeing we have this ministry, as we have not received mercy, we faint not. The Christian life is a life that never quits. The Christian life, however, also at the same time is a life that you know and I know is a life filled with all sorts of distractions. You know, it's easy for us in times such as this to look over at each other and say, let us pray. But who controls your life outside of this place? See, as Christians, we're not people who cower in fear. We're not people who faint not at all the things that happen in the world. But as you and I know, it's still not just that simple. In the midst of our discussion of who controls your life tonight, we're going to look at three different things. I think they're going to be simple. We're going to look, number one, at the little G God of this world. Is that who controls our life? Now, we probably don't ask that question enough. Am, am I connected? Are you connected to the one who's called the little G God of the world? We'll discuss who that is here in just a few moments. Am I connected to the world so much I follow everything that the world does? Is that who we are as people? And then we're going to look in the second place. Are we following Jesus Christ the Lord? And as we go through 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7, we're going to make that evident. And that's why as this particular chapter begins, he says, therefore, if you leave the middle section out, therefore we faint not. We can't be a people who faint. Because in the midst of everything that's going on in our lives, there, rooted at the center of our lives, in the midst of Christianity, stands a place called Golgotha. The Savior was placed upon the cross. Do we follow our Lord? And then, in the midst of those two ideas, we need to move over to a different point. What's the real issue here? And we're going to give some scriptures that you can take home with you. And we're going to look at 
two different things in that particular point. And we're going to have to answer the question, what is the real issue? What God do we serve? Is it the gods of the world? We're going to have to answer that tonight. Is it Christ Jesus the Lord? We're going to have to answer that tonight. And on both sides of that coin, we have to get to the point of the real issue. Because being a child of God, being a Christian, a Christ-like person, is not something that we just happened into. It didn't happen that way, and it never does. What God do we serve? Let's begin by thinking about the God of this world and look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and look at verses 3 and 4. We look at verse 4, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Let's pause for just a quick moment. This is a matter of eternity. Look at the word lost. I want to sear this into your mind. I don't want you to forget this. Lost means... Separated away from God. Separated away from God. While we were at Polishing the Pulpit this past week, twice that I noticed someone got up to make an announcement. A child was lost. It was separated away from the parents. And in both of those occasions, the child did not know where the parents were. And the parents did not know where the child was. But I want us to understand something about this word lost. When we are lost, when we are separated away from God, we do not know where God is. But I want you to note this, God knows where we are. God may be the furthest idea, the furthest concept from our mind when we're lost. But we're not the furthest from His. So here he says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Look at verse 4. In whom the little g gods of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Who are the little g gods of this world? Well, when you start basing all of that out, that's a very intricate question. Because when you go back to the New Testament, and you see the disciples of Christ, you see the apostles of Christ walking throughout the earth, you'll find times where they even find temples. They even find shrines and which were given to the unknown God. The people of that area, they wanted to make sure they worshipped every god they could find, so they even put one up just in case they forgot one. The, the man-made gods. See, that's a harder concept for us because now we see some of these man-made gods as fairy tale stories. Zeus. How many children's movies are made from Mount Olympus? and the lightning in which He would rain down, and all of that mythological family that existed. See, we don't look at Zeus as a little g-god because He's been characterized. But the people that lived during the day in which we're reading this, they had to fight with this. It was real. You go to the Old Testament. I, I continue to come back to this particular little g-god because he's proven over and over and over again. And, and you're probably thinking about the God of Baal. And, and that's one that stands out tremendously to us. But the little g-god of Dagon, they carved him out and they put him on a shelf. And that's the God they served. Man made up their own God. But what does that have to root with? Well, it goes all the way back ultimately to the one who does not want us to know who the real God is. We call him the devil. We call him Satan. We call him the tempter. But it ultimately goes all the way back to there. And in that concept of the gods of this world, I've entitled it specifically the God of this world, if we base all sin and trace it back to its beginnings, where does it go? If we base everyone who, verse 3, that was lost... Where does that lead back to? Why, well, it leads back to the one who 
is filled with darkness. The New Testament is constantly talking about how light sheds out darkness. Truth. Light is synonymous for truth. Isn't it interesting that darkness cannot be in the presence of light? And neither can the devil be in the presence of truth. The God of this world. Here's the first thought. The God of this world, as you know, is someone who only has to add one word. I I want to bring your minds back to this and go back to Genesis chapter 3. The earth was rather young. Mankind was, in the phrase that is wonderfully to be used, was fresh. This was new. The universe as we understand it had never seen something in the form as mankind. Because when you look in Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, God creates something that's distinctive. He creates mankind. And mankind's not distinctive because God created him. He's not distinctive because he has a heart in his body in which beats. He's not distinctive because he can walk about the earth. He's not distinctive because he can roam the earth and take care of the earth and he can live and breathe upon the earth. He's distinctive because God, in the midst of creating man, made man in the image of God. In other words, there's some proponent here that is eternal. This earth at some point in time will no longer be. But mankind will be. But you look back in Genesis chapter 3, and this is an occasion where we see in verse 1, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden. God has said, Ye shall not eat it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now notice this. Verse 4, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. I I, I want to tell us something just for a moment that that the gods of this world does. Whether we say we're going to ultimately bring it all the way back, which is what I'm proposing to us, and call it who it is, the tempter, the serpent, the one who is talked about as the devil, the one who does not want us to know who God is, or we talk about all the things we put in place of God. That, That list is vast. Or if we talk about the man-made gods like Zeus and Dagon, the things we put in front of God, that's what that was. It was a screen so no one had to obey God, and it made religion easy. Mankind has been influenced by one word for years. If you look at the preaching of today, go home. This is your sermon homework. Go home, turn on the television, find a religious station, and you just wait. And you're going to find something like this. Call in for your prayer cloth. Your holy water, you can call in and you can sprinkle that on your forehead and you will be saved. You can call in for a special prayer and you can accept Jesus into your heart. That's just an addition. Mankind has been dealing with addition since Genesis chapter 3. Here in the context, uh, he says unto her, you can eat anything you want. And No, but God has already told us this is what we can do, but of the tree that's in the center there, I cannot eat of. And, and, And notice this, he says, lest ye die. And all he says was, you shall not... One word, N-O-T, small, she understood what it meant. You shall not surely die. The God or gods of this world, however it may be put, they add words to change what God has made them. The gods of this world, the things we put in front of God, the devil in which exists in context of Scripture and in the world in which we know, is one who uses simplicity. I am a simple person, and I really like things to be simple. I need them to be simple so I can understand them. But you know, when you get into Genesis chapter 4, here's Adam and Eve, and now they have children on the scene. 
Verse 1 says, She conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain was a tiller of the ground. You know where I'm going with this. They're about to come to worship. But two different types of worship are going to be brought. And one is being brought out of simplicity. One brings the offering which is going to be deemed, according to this particular area, and even when you go into Hebrews chapter 12, an offering that was acceptable unto God. And the other is going to bring something else because it was simplistic to the mind. It made sense to the mind. I'll bring of that which I've, I've worked at. Why was the offering of Cain not acceptable unto God? It wasn't because it was simplistic. It was because it was not what God expected. See, the simplicity of the mind tells us we can do it this way. You know, this makes it more convenient. We are people of convenience. I dare to venture to say, if you said the word convenience in front of Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, huh? We are people of convenience. Do we allow convenience to get in the way? When it comes to this book, very important book, do we allow convenience to get, do we allow simplicity to get in the way? You see, here it was much easier, it's much more convenient to bring what he had worked with. That's what he did. And he brought the fruit of his labors. The God of this world uses simplistic things. You know, that makes sense, doesn't it? He'd work so hard on all of these things which would come from the ground, he'll bring them. And it makes sense to our mind because it's so simple. He's worked so hard. But it was not what God expected. That's why we read in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that the God of this world walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It does not matter if we're talking about ultimately tracing everything back in which is involved with sin to the one that's called Satan, the devil. It does not matter if we're talking about the things we put in front of God. Or if we're talking about the little gods that we create or the ways we change religion to make it more simplistic to me or just adding one little word. It doesn't matter if we're talking about those things. I want you to see in verse 8 here of 1 Peter chapter 5, the word devour. It means to take you from the state that you're in and abolish that. It's a concept of destruction. Ruin, seeking whom he may destroy. First Peter chapter one, verse five, or chapter five, verse eight here, talks about him as a roaring lion. And that almost gives us the concept of courage. But I want to tell you something about this one who walks about as a roaring lion. He's nothing but a coward in disguise. I want to tell you simplistically, maybe simplistically is not the word I want to look for there. I want to tell you plainly that when we follow the world, however we may define that in the context of this discussion, we're following people, we're following groups, we're following ideas that are not of God. And that makes us cowards. Why is it hard to stand up for the truth? That, that question has a million answers. Here's the best. Because nobody's doing it. It would be easy if everybody was doing it. If everybody took this book and did everything as you should, it would be easy to do it, wouldn't it? But notice it in 1 Peter, 1, 1 Peter 5, 8. He walks about as a roaring lion. He has to be in disguise because it has to look easy. Disguise. 
disguise. Is that who we're following? Are we following someone in disguise? Someone who adds a word, someone who plays off of simplicity of mind, or someone who walks about in disguise? Is that who we follow? Let's move into the next place and go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we need to center in on verse 5. Because here we understand the concept that's being presented that we have to do. I don't like point number one. The gods or the God of this world. Because of verse 3. To them that are lost. But look at verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Who, in the context of religious discussions, matters? Is it Zeus? Dagon? We could get historical with all the little g-gods of the Old Testament. Is it the things that we place in front of God that are important? Is that what we should be presenting? Should we be presenting the ideas that our world want to present or would want presented? The ideas of acceptance. Do we preach acceptance? And you know what's meant by that. And if you don't, here's the quick rundown. You do what you need to do. I'll do what I need to do. And everything else will be okay. Do we preach the message of tolerance? You know, sin exists. We, we, we have to admit that. And, and because we read phrases like Christ Jesus the Lord, we have to understand sin exists. So who do we follow? We're going to follow what the world wants us to follow. The world right now is shouting some very loud things. We're going to have to, according to the world, accept a lot of things. Do we do that? Is that the type of people we, we follow? Look back at verse 4, about midway through verse 4. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Why does darkness not want light presented in the world? Why does darkness not want light presented in the world? Because light in the midst of darkness always shines. Here's the real simple way of what we just said. Truth always stands in place above and in perfection of error. God's Word stands true. Are we going to present Christ Jesus our Lord? Here's three reasons why. Number one, in the midst of Jesus is a way of escape found. We spend quite a bit of time in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4 and Mark chapter 1 detailing the accounts that happened specifically in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. The three times that Jesus was tempted there. We talk about the first temptation, which was a way to get the Lord to obey the tempter, the little g-god of this world, and disobey the one true living God. And we talk about how Christ responded there in that particular section from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. This is what the Word of God says. In other words, remember what he, what he said? It is written. Talking about the book of Deuteronomy. It's talking about all the things that God's people need to know and need to understand. We talk a lot about the second temptation, which is a temptation that classifies after lust. Will you turn these stones to bread? How many of us after a day would like to turn stones into bread? much less the amount of time that's being discussed in these some 40 days. We talk about that third temptation here. In which was an appeal to get Christ to understand or to get Christ to have 
all of the things that he already has. Do you want to know why we do not serve the one who's called the devil, Satan? Because Jesus Christ provides a way of escape. He quoted from Deuteronomy 8.3, the second time Deuteronomy 6.16, the third time Deuteronomy 6.13. And in each occasion, he verbally stated, it is written. Christians, we're supposed to be different. I know we're not perfect. Don't, don't try to think that's what I'm trying to say. I'm, I'm not trying to say that. I know you're not, and you want to know something that might shock you? I know I'm not. But we're different. I don't serve the world. We don't serve the world. That's why we're distinctive in image. We're distinctive in our worship. We're distinctive in the way we look as people. But He provides an escape. Here He provides an escape in the form of an example. I think sometimes we're lost on the concept of what's happening here from Him quoting from Scripture. Because in His weakest moment at the time in which He has faced to date in Matthew chapter 4. From his entire ministry, from the entire time he has lived upon the earth, in his weakest state, physically, three temptations come. It is written, it is written, it is written is always the answer. He provides a way of escape by means of example. Now I know that saying that is just an easy way to do it. So let's look at some more things. Jesus is one who gives the way of life. Uh, go with me to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. You probably know this passage by heart. And many of us have memorized this particular passage. But it's one to note. John chapter 14. I, I love to look at passages with my eyes. And, and I love to look at passages to see them right where they're happening but you look at verse 5, and here Jesus was saying, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back. Thomas is responding back in verse 5. He said unto him, Lord or Master, we know not whether thou goest, and how can we know the way? An honest question to be asked. The disciples at the time in which we're reading about here in John chapter 14, they didn't quite see the big picture. Lord, where are you going and how do we get there is the question that he's asking. How do we do what is responsible and what is right? Look at verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If you had known me, you should have known, that my, or known my Father also. And from henceforth you know him and have seen him. When Jesus was in his ministry in the short time that it existed in that three and a half years, approximately. Multiple occasions Jesus was found in Scripture by saying that he was here to do his Father's business. Jesus shows us here, in, in following Jesus, we understand by the way he's showing us that we have to be about our Heavenly Father's business Why do we think that we're different? Why, why do we think we can do different things in the way we live our lives and not be acceptable or acceptable unto the Heavenly Father when while Jesus Christ was upon the earth, His mission was to do the will of the Father? Jesus shows us the way. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But not only that, he gave Himself. John chapter 12, if you turn back just a bit. I just want us to see verses 32 and 33 before we move on from this point. Because we need to understand Jesus gives a way of escape. Jesus is the way in which we need to travel in life. But not only that, Jesus not just what we need by example, and not just showed us how to do it, but He gave it all. You look at verse 32 of John chapter 12. We read this, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Who's the I? Go back to what's happening here in verse 30. And Jesus 
Or Jesus answered and said. Read verse 32 with me this way. And Jesus, if Jesus is lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto Jesus. Understand it that way. Because there is no other way to follow in this life than following after Jesus Christ the Lord. But make it emphatic with verse 33. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Not only did he say, this is what I'm going to do. Not only was this the plan that came before the foundations of the world, but he signified what death he was going to die, and he accomplished it. If you take Jesus outside of religion and remove him, you have nothing. So we have to understand, I don't follow the God of this world or any of the so-called man-made gods of this world, but I have to follow after the one who is trustworthy, which moves us into this particular scene. What's the real issue here? We're talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7 in that particular scene, about what we do in life. And I want you to notice this. The, the thrust so far down to verse 5 is that we don't hide the gospel. We take the gospel and we let it be a glorious light to all of those that are around us because that is our responsibility. But why is this so hard? I want to show you these scriptures here on the screen. We're not going to discuss a single one of them. It would be impossible for us to do so in detail. This entire section in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, is a section that really is, in the reality of things, a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart, but specifically, it's a matter of the heart of pride. It's an eye problem. And I'm not talking about the two eyes that we have. It's an eye problem. When I follow after the world, it's an eye problem. And we have so many concepts of this in Scripture. In the book of Esther, one that comes to mind really easy to us, it was an eye problem. It wasn't the king, it wasn't Mordecai, it wasn't the soon-to-be future queen. It wasn't those who served the king per se, but it was one of them. His name was Haman, remember? He had an eye problem. He wanted Mordecai to worship him. And that problem, the problem of self, destroyed everything he had. You look at King Saul in the Old Testament. After David slew Goliath, his popularity grew. But you know, it did not just grow with the kingdom that was under his reign. It grew in his own family. Remember the soul of Jonathan and David, what were they? They were knit together. King Saul didn't like it. It was an eye problem. And the same thing's true with you and me. The heart of the matter of what's happening here about spreading the gospel as we should, about being the type of people, we have to understand this. If we're going to spread the gospel, we have to be of the gospel. I can't profess to be a child of God on Sunday and be a drunk on Monday. I can't live my life in sin and profess to be out Christ or after Christ or living in His name. Because that's not what I'm doing. It becomes an eye problem. We go after the things we want to do. And we get lost in all of those things. Here's the, the real issue. Not only is it an eye problem, but it's a problem about how we view the Word of God. It's a problem about how we view the Word of God. Now, I'm not saying that those of us that are here tonight have a problem with the way we view the Word of God. 
But understand in occasions like Acts chapter 8, where Philip was preaching the gospel, the gospel was presented, and you look in that particular section for verse 12 all the way down to verse 39, people obeyed the gospel. That's it. There wasn't a gimmick, there wasn't a trick, there wasn't a show. Those who became Christians in the age in which we're reading, say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, did so because of, and I think it's ironic, the Word of God. Remember Jesus Christ and His example in Matthew chapter 4? What was His way of escape for temptation? The Word of God. It's a way we look at the Word of God. In the midst of the Word of God is Christ. You cannot look at the Word of God and separate Christ outside of the Word of God. You can't do it in the Old Testament either. Because everything that happens in the Old Testament was pointing to the cross. And everything from the time the cross existed to the time it was finished to the time Jesus Christ rose again on the third day, everything has been pointing toward eternity because of the cross. And all of this is found in the Word of God. The Word of God includes things like entrance into the kingdom of heaven. I love the phrase, the kingdom of heaven. It's a kingdom. It's not like this world. It's different. It's distinctive. God's Word gives us information regarding life. It gives us information regarding teaching. God's Word, word gives us Information regarding the death, the burial, and the resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ. It gives us the conditions of salvation. It gives us the blessings that we have as children of God. Here's why it's an eye problem and a problem of the way we look at the Word of God. In the context of what God do we serve? We've not really answered the question of what God do we serve. I hope as you're sitting here, you're serving the Lord. I hope that's your answer. I hope you're not serving the world. I hope you're not serving this world. Because that means 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, you're lost. You're left in ruin. But here's why the heart of pride, the eye problem, and the Word of God have to have their connection. When I only look at self, here's what happens. When I look at self, I forget about this book. And I get distracted. And I get caught up in the things of this world. New Testament teaches us that salvation is here. That we become new creatures, that we become perfect in the midst of Jesus Christ. We're complete in Christ. We're going to be reconciled. We're going to be forgiven. We're going to be put in the one body. We're going to be put into the one church. We're going to be put in a conversation that's discussed in Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. We're going to be put in a classification of people who are blessed at death. That's why I, when I look at self, when the heart of pride comes to matter, has a lot to do with the Word of God. It's the real issue. Who controls your life? Is it God? Here's my last illustration. Is it God? There are a lot of books you could read. Some may be very profitable. But there's no greater book than this. If, if we see anything from this particular lesson tonight, I want us to understand that God's Word has to be number one in our life. There's no way around it. There's no way around that fact. Who controls your life? Is it God or is it this world? Bryce has picked out an invitation song. This is a moment for us to consider the question, who controls your life? Everyone in this room has to do so. And only one of two answers is going to be given. Either I serve the Lord, the Almighty God, the one true living God, the one who is true, who is right, who is accurate, who created us, who sustains us, and who will save us, and who will keep us for eternity, or I do not. 
That's the only answer here. If you're not a child of God tonight, I'm going to say this, and I say it gently. If you're not a child of God tonight, you're not serving God. And He is not in control of your life. Now, I'm not saying that's the case of our children. Understand that. But if you know you're supposed to be serving God, if you know you're supposed to be His and you are not His, you are not His. You can be tonight if you choose to be. It's also the case that tonight as we sit here as children of God, people who follow after God, people who expect in our own lives and not only profess to be following God, following after Jesus Christ, it could be the case that we were distracted and we've not been serving Him. You can start that over again tonight. You can make your life right with the Lord. But we're back to that same question. Who controls your life? No one's going to make you become a child of God. No one's going to make you get your life right with the Lord if there's something inaccurate. Only you. And only you can answer that as together we stand and sing. When peace like a river.